Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today I have with me my friend, Dr. Mark Talbot. Dr. Talbot, welcome to the show, brother. It's good to be back. I know you probably prefer me to call you Mark, but I've always, <laughs> I always, I always, you know, growing up around the mill, my dad is a lieutenant colonel. And so I always was sir and doctor. <laughs> but I always defer to that. But anyway, can you, uh, can you catch us up on your life, marriage, ministry, any ministry projects that you're working on? Sure. I'm uh, still teaching at Wheaton. I'm teaching two courses rather than three a term. Um, still married. Uh, and it That's will a good sound trite. At 43 years, almost 44 years, and it will sound trite, but as uh, as time goes on, I just value my wife and our marriage more and more. Mm. Uh, it's just remarkable how a long, good marriage is a comfort and a gift from God. Mm. Um, what I'm working on right now is the third volume for this series that I'm writing on suffering in the Christian life. Uh, the third volume is entitled, Our God Will Never Leave Us or Forsake Us. And what it does is it covers how God, through his spirit, is always with us um, uh, now, primarily as we hear and read his word. Uh, that's the way in which he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit personally. And then it has a couple of chapters that plumb the scriptures to display their perspective on God's providence. Well, I suppose the one new thing is that we've started a podcast covering these books called When the Stars Disappear. Uh, and boy, I tell you, Dave, I've I've learned just how much work goes into these things. It's rather <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most people are like, oh, I'll just, uh, you know, edit it a little bit or whatever. And uh, I, I, I go all the way uh, on, on, on these and people are like they have no idea. But yeah, uh, that's you're right. right. You're right. That's that's awesome, man. I, I'm looking forward, brother, to that next book. Uh, this is this is a good series. So. Well, can you tell us about Give Me Understanding That I May Live, Situating Our Suffering Within God's Redemptive Plan, why you wrote it, and how you hope it'll be received? Right. The key for both this and my first book, When the Stars Disappear, is um, the fact that I stress that stories are much more central in our lives than we usually realize. We orient ourselves in life. We make sense of life by means of the stories we tell. So, for instance, if somebody were to ask you or me, um, uh, why are you talking together right now? That would be answered in terms of a story. Uh, and uh, the story would probably go back to the last time we talked over a year ago and all that sort of thing. Uh, if, if I were to ask you, Dave, what, what do you want to accomplish in your life? That, again, would involve a story, a much longer and bigger story. Uh, we can call those stories our personal stories. And what it comes to is that because we're finite creatures who, in fact, are living in time, we can only do one or two things at a time. And some of what we want to do is mere preparation for other things. So, for instance, if somebody wants to read the Bible, they've got to learn how to read first. So our personal stories deal with all of that. But then what I want to say is that what we want to do is also affected by what we take to be the true general story about the universe and the world that we live in. If we think that God doesn't exist, for instance, then we're not gonna pray. If we think we are just the most highly evolved of earthly creatures uh, destined to disappear when we die, then in fact, we're going to think that love can't last forever. You and I were talking ahead of time about, about uh, how hard it is to watch our parents get old and lose some of their um, previous interests, their ability to express themselves and so on. For non-Christians, there's just no hope for that ever being different. For Christians, there is. 
Hmm. So what the what the first volume did, what when the stars disappeared did was it dealt with how suffering impacts our personal stories. And it considered particularly the personal stories of Naomi, Job, and Jeremiah in order to show that no matter how it may seem, God never abandons his children. Hmm. And since he doesn't, we can trust him with our personal stories even when we're suffering so deeply that we can't make sense of life. Mm. Now, what the second volume does, give me understanding that I may live, is it tells the full Christian story. It explains why there's any suffering. It explains why there's so much suffering and what will finally gloriously be true for those who confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and who believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. That story has four parts. Creation, rebellion, redemption, and what's called consummation. Those four parts, in fact, constitute, I love this phrase, the true story of the whole world. They constitute the true story of the whole world. And here's what I want to have happen with that book. I want readers to find courage and strength and purpose as they begin to grasp how each of our personal stories is meant to play a small but important part in this, the true general story that our triune God has planned and plotted out from before time began. Mm. That's, that's really, really good. Really good. And guys, the book is really, uh, it's really good. It's really easy to read. It's easy to understand. It's, you know, it's full of practical, you know, illustrations and uh just just really it's really a helpful book brother it's it's good um that considered i guess that that could be an endorsement i just so, <laughs> a, like an endorsement level length i guess i mean i don't know but it, it's a it's a helpful book I, I thought it was really good so you you know you were just talking about creation rebellion redemption and consummation um why is it critical for christians to think about god's larger story of creation rebellion redemption and consummation when considering suffering i think the most crucial reason is that according to scripture there was no human suffering until our first parents rebelled from eating uh, rebelled by eating from the forbidden tree so there was no suffering in the world as god created it god created a pristine world And so he can't be blamed for the suffering that has entered our world. Suffering only entered the world after Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had warned them in no uncertain terms that if they ate from that tree, they would die. Hmm. Well, what did that mean? It meant that if they disobeyed God, they would be alienated from him. But in fact, fellowship with God, as I tried to explain in the second chapter, fellowship with God, which is the opposite of alienation from him, is our only true source of life. So spiritual death was bound to follow immediately on Adam and Eve's disobedience. And then biological death was bound to follow eventually since they were now cut off from life's only true source. Even more, they were now now bound not only to die, but also to suffer. Because suffering is part of what Henri Blochet in his great book, In the Beginning, calls the funeral procession that human life cut off from its true source has inevitably become. Mm. So what it comes to, Dave, is that in order for us to understand our suffering, we have to know how Adam and Eve's disobedience affected all of us. Because of their disobedience, we are all now biologically born dead in our transgressions and sins. We're born biologically, but we're dead spiritually. So we're biologically alive, but dead spiritually. And we all act now in ways that show that we're alienated from God, that we are his enemies. And so we're also a part of this funeral procession that leads to biological death. And ultimately, of course, to what is known as the second death, which is eternal separation from God. Mm. The third part of the story picks up on the fact that the only way for human suffering to end 
is for us to be reconciled with God. Mm. But we can't achieve that for ourselves. And so that's what the third part of the story is about. God's son became incarnate in the man Jesus, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the effects of Adam and Eve's sin. Mm. He died to redeem us from sin, suffering, and death. But his earthly work accomplished more than just enabling us to become reconciled with God. It culminated in his physical resurrection Mm. into an entirely new kind of life that Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15 will become our kind of life when our Lord returns. And that will be a life of no suffering and no death, no more tears, no more sorrow, a perfect and not merely pristine life of unhindered and unending communication with God the Father through the Son, mediated to us by the Holy Spirit. That is what is known as the consummation that God has planned and plotted out from before the world began. Mm. As you're talking, I'm like, you know what? This is really a satisfactory answer even to the problem of evil, if you think about it. I mean, you're talking, you're talking, I'm like, wait a minute. This actually, maybe I never made that connection before, but I mean, you think about it, like people blame God, that God came, you know, he spoke, he created, he made everything. We sinned, we're sinners by nature and by choice. So right. Genesis 3.15, he had to send forth the first gospel, which is the story of the whole Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, Colossians 1 tells us that, uh, you know, about about Christ and how he's... You know, the firstborn of all creation, he came, bled, and died, and, and rose in our place and for our sin. He's coming back. I mean, he he did it all. Yep, yep. So so he, and he had, is and, and so people say today, people say today, you know, hey, it's all it's all um why do bad things happen to to quote unquote good people? But right the the, the that's the wrong question. Yes, yes. Like RC, RC Sproul said, what's wrong with you people? You know, know? what's wrong with you people? It's, it's why do, why, why does anything good happen to us at all? Yes. Yes. And, and one of the, one of the great things about the whole story, I think, Dave, is the fact that God didn't allow Adam and Eve just to stew in their sin. Uh, Almost immediately after they sin, he walks in the garden and comes to them and asks them questions so that they have a chance to own up to what they've done, and then gives them in Genesis 3.15 this pro-evangelium, this first um, announcement of the fact that God is going to do something that will make everything right. And so, so what came out of rebellion with regard to redemption, was always before the human race. Mm. That's so good. So good. This is why people are like, well, biblical theology. I mean, dude, biblical theology is fun because it when you get the whole story in, in the specific parts, then you actually can, can actually start to see, hey, this is what God is doing. Hey, by the extension, this is what God's doing in my life today you know, in, in, uh, in some ways, you know, we have to qualify that a little bit, but. Right, right. But no, no, that's, that's exactly right. We need to be able to live a story that is coherent and satisfying. And that means that we need a story with enough detail to answer at least most of the questions that we may have about why life is as it is. I know no story that is even close to approaching the satisfaction that the Christian story articulates. Mm, It's so good. So, you know, in light of what we were just talking about, how does understanding the full significance of our first parents' choice to disobey help us understand what human life was supposed to be like in Eden? What we get in Genesis 1 and 2 is that God created us so that we could be his visible images on earth, who would in fact rule the earth as he himself would. You find that in verse 26 of chapter one of Genesis. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. So Adam and Eve were supposed to do this by being in communion or fellowship 
with God. Now, being in communion or fellowship with another person requires us to make an explicitly covenantal commitment, a promise, a particularly strong promise to that person that binds us to them and them to us in the closest of ways. So, in fact, a life lived in communion with another person is meant to be one of infinite, intimate attunement with that person and what that person loves and values. And that is supposed to, in fact, inspire, guide, strengthen, and encourage both us and them as we go along our way. The best example of this in ordinary life involves the vows that a husband and wife take to each other in the marriage ceremony. Um, I mentioned that I've, I find that I just appreciate my wife and marriage more and more as time goes on. I actually quote from Martin Buber, one of his books. He was the guy who wrote a book called I and Thou, which was on interpersonal dialogue. And uh, Buber um, uh, dedicated one of his books to his wife. And it went like this, the abyss and the light of the world. In other words, complete darkness and all the light of the world, time's need and the craving for eternity, vision, event, and poetry, was and is dialogue with you. Hmm. That's the way it feels to me with regard to my wife. Uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. So marriage, in fact, gives us some idea of what it would be like to be in communion with God. Hmm. In order to be in communion with God, Adam and Eve had to be irrevocably committed to him. Hmm. And so God gave Adam the command that's found in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, in order to give them the chance or the choice of being fully and irrevocably committed to him. You remember how that command goes, Dave. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Mm. God's giving Adam, and by implication Eve, that command was God's graciousness to our first parents. He was, in effect, stepping away from them and allowing them to choose whether they would be fully committed to him and his ways. It's rather like Jesus' words to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. What Jesus was offering to the Laodiceans was to live a life of intimate fellowship and communion with them. That's what the eating is all about. If only they would hear his voice and open the door. And God, in Genesis 2, was making exactly the same sort of offer to Adam and Eve. But of course, then what we're told in Genesis 3 is that Adam and Eve weren't willing to hear God's voice and obey him. Instead, they listened to the voice of the serpent who told them that they wouldn't die if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He told them that if they ate of the tree, they'd become like God, knowing good and evil. And then by eating from that tree, what happened was they severed their spiritual lifeline to God. And the result is, of course, all the sin, sickness, suffering, sorrow, and death that we now experience. Mm, it's really good. Really good. Well, um, in light of that, how does the creation story help us to counter false assumptions about the Lord and ourselves? Well, with regard to some of the false assumptions that we tend to make about the Lord, if we don't know the creation story, we're likely to look at the world and ask, why did God create a world that is so full of human suffering? If you read the first long paragraph of C.S. Lewis's Problem of Pain, that's the very point that he makes, that God wouldn't be good if he made a world with all of this kind of suffering in it. So in other words, if we don't know the beginning of the story, we're going to blame God for our suffering. But the point is that he didn't create a world full of human suffering. He created a world without any human suffering, and then we, in the persons of in the person of our first parents, Adam and Eve, by refusing to obey his command not to eat from the forbidden tree, brought human suffering into the world. Mm. Now, regarding the kinds of false assumptions that we may make about ourselves, we assume that we are really alive because we have biological life. So we come into the world thinking, well, we've got everything we should have. But as Jesus declared to Nicodemus, 
unless we're born again, we can't see the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Now, to Nicodemus, that was very puzzling. But in a sense, it shouldn't have been if he had really understood what had happened when Adam and Eve decided to disobey God by eating from the forbidden tree. Mm-hmm. We falsely assume that to have the essentials for animal life, in other words, uh, food, air, water, and some sort of support from other creatures like us, we falsely assume that to have that is to have real life. But by um, uh, deflecting the devil's temptation to turn stones into bread, we find that our Lord said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Mm. As persons, our lives are sustained only by fellowship with other persons, both human and divine. And of course, it's primarily our fellowship with God, our communion with God that gives us real life. Mm. That's really good. Yeah. And like we're, like we're talking about this whole story approach, it, it does a way somebody, you might be listening to this and you might be like, well, is God interested in me? Well, the whole creation story, the whole story of the Bible tells you that, tells you that answer. It yes. Me, yes. God is not disinterested in you. I think it's Psalm 37, four guys near to the broken heart. I mean, yeah. yeah. Like your next book is going to show he was 13, five and nine. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It highlights his immutable character. So God yeah. can't forsake his own that he made. So. Yes. Yes. Really good. How does uh, suffering challenge or cast out on the stories we previously believed to be true? Well, it seems to me that far too many of us have been taught a shallow and inaccurate version of Christianity. We've either been told, or at least it's been implied, that if we become Christians, then life will improve for us. Hmm. And part of the improvement, it's at least suggested will involve our not suffering much. Of course, the health and wealth gospel goes beyond that. You're going to get all sorts of goodies, too. (laughs) If we put it a bit differently, on some level or another, as Karen Jobes, in fact, writes in her commentary on 1 Peter, we all know that this world of suffering and death is not the way life is supposed to be. What she says is misfortune and death are certainly normal, in the sense that they're universally experienced, but they are not normal when viewed from God's intention in creation and his plan of redemption. And then she goes on and she says, the idea that normal life should always be harmonious and free from suffering, despite universal suffering and death, remains a lingering echo of life in Eden as God created it before the fall. It's also a longing, she says, for a time when there will be no more tears, suffering, pain, and death. Now, our sense that suffering violates life can then make us doubt whether Christianity is true because we aren't familiar enough with the full Christian story to understand that what there was indeed once a time when there was no suffering, and there will be another time when there will be no more suffering for God's children. But these times, those two times, are the outermost parts of the Christian story. They're, they're so to speak, the bookends. First two chapters of Genesis, last two chapters of Revelation. And between those two parts, we have both the story of rebellion and the story of the beginning of redemption and what great Christ did for us and will still do for us. And those are the parts of the story that we're now in. So we shouldn't expect right now that we're going to live comfortable lives. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jesus in John 16, 33 said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's right. You're you're going to face tribulation. It's not going to be good. And he he says, if they, um, the the, the servants are not greater than their master, if if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And we're told that if we're not willing to openly declare Jesus as Lord, then he will not, in fact, um, um, openly declare us as 
his children. So if we do just what Christians are supposed to do, and speaking of all of these wonderful things that are in this story, we're going to find that there is a lot of tribulation from non-Christians in the world, and yet we'll be armed for it. We'll understand why it happens. Doesn't mean it's pleasant, but we'll understand why it's happening. Yep. Yeah. And that and that actually is the most comforting thing of all. It it, it may seem, you know, rather trite if you're if you're thinking about it in in, in uh, just a very limited perspective. But when you zoom out and you see actually God and his kindness and his goodness in the whole story of the Bible is actually doing these things, then then you can see that it's not really that basic. It's not, you know, it's simple enough. I think we could say it's simple enough for a child to understand, like my four-year-old nephew. But it's it's so complex that, you know, uh, thousands of volumes, and I mean thousands right. of volumes with thousands of pages have been written on the subject of yep. these things. So. Yep. Yep. No, it's an amazing story that way that that even the simplest can understand enough about it to um, say, I want Jesus to be my savior. And yet even the deepest of us can't plumb the depths of the story. Yeah. Amen. Brother. <laughs> well, you know, readers may be surprised that you don't say much about suffering until you've reconciled the first two parts of the Christian story, creation, rebellion. Why is that? Well, that's because there's nothing to say about suffering until Adam and Eve rebelled. And so it makes no sense to talk about it until after we've heard the first two parts of the story. Uh, uh, in fact, the Bible itself follows that very storyline. Suffering and death don't become actual parts of the story until after Adam and Eve have disobeyed. And then there's immediately suffering, and God says, and there's going to be more suffering, and you get into chapter 4 of Genesis, and you realize how horrific the suffering becomes when one brother kills his, his other brother, and the brother who does the killing, the murderer, is in fact banished um, uh, from the sight of his parents. Hmm. I think in addition, Dave, what it comes to is that suffering shouldn't preoccupy us so that it becomes the only or main thing that we think about. We need to recognize the wonders of what God did in creating the world and persons like us. Uh, it's easy when we're suffering to think that nothing else is important other than getting an answer to this or getting out of the suffering. But that isn't, that isn't the message of the Bible. Even now, suffering isn't the whole of life, and we mustn't take it to be such. You'll remember that Paul reminded the pagan polytheists in Lystra that God had not left himself without a witness to them in their daily lives. And the way he put that witness was, for he did good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Mm. So while we know by reading Genesis 3 that, that Eve's daughters will suffer physically and emotionally as they marry and they have families, we also know that they may experience great joy in their marriages and families as well. And while Adam's sons will always have to scratch a living from the ground, you and I both know, and people should in general know, that the end of long days of work may still be satisfying if we labored as we should. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really, really good. And then, and then if you have worked hard, uh, make sure you rest. You know, right. don't don't and give yourself, you know, if you're having a hard day, give yourself a break, cut yourself some slack. You know, as a guy, I can be really I'm a type A personality and I, I'm very driven. And then I have a military work ethic because of my my dad. And <laughs> you know, so I'm I'm like, you know, I got to I got to remind myself, hey, it's it's OK to take a break and yeah. it's OK to give myself some grace. And I just get into what I'm doing, and then the day is over. I'm just like, where did that, where did that, where did that day go? Did I get done? What I and, and especially in my 20s, I was so, and even early 30s, I was so guilty. I'm like, man, I did not get enough, so I got to get to do some more, you know. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't do it now. Um, I'm in, I'm in my early 40s. I can't, I can't do that anymore. Um, I'm, I get tired. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, some people are like you're like superhuman. I'm like, mm, I'm not. I get tired. 
Trust me, I can only do so much, but I've had to learn to give myself some grace. And so what you're saying is is really good. We need a rhythm. And, and the rhythm, yeah. I think, properly is six days of working and one day of rest. Uh, and a day of rest that isn't just sitting around and idling. It's the rest of offering praise to God, which is the only way that we can rest. What I quite often say to my students is that if they try to work all the time, they are setting themselves up as if they're God. Mm. Uh, they're trying to do what only God can do. And yet God himself, we're told, rested from his work of creation on the seventh day. Mm. It's really good. Really good. Well, you describe the general stories of various worldviews as either taking a either a top-down or bottom-up approach. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think that's actually some of the most interesting stuff that I do in the book, Dave. A top-down story starts from the highest reality we know, namely God as a person. In fact, as a triune God and therefore three persons. And then it explains the world in terms of his purposes. A bottom-up story starts from the most impersonal reality we know, namely brute matter obeying natural laws, and then explains the world in terms of those laws and mere chance. And um, the result of those two ways of approaching things is that either you can believe that human life really has some meaning and that no matter what happens in this life, that um, uh, life can be redeemed in uh, really wonderful ways or you don't. Of course, the main bottom-up story in our time is Darwinian evolution. And uh, a whole lot of people in our secular society, if they don't believe it explicitly, tend to think it's true. It's part of what accounts for the fact that there is uh, so much depression in our world now because people no longer feel that their lives really are meaningful and that what they do in this life has some meaning beyond just their life alone. Uh, it's the Christian top-down story that uh, that says, look, God planned and purposed all of this. And, and it gives us a richer world, Dave. Among other things, um, I was looking out yesterday uh, in, in my neighborhood as I was getting ready to sit in the living room and start my work early in the morning. And uh, you could see all the freshness of the sun coming up and uh, the, the trees swaying in the breeze and so on and so forth. If you believe the top-down story, you can believe that all of the beauty of that is something that God intentionally put in the world, in part for our pleasure. You can look at the birds and the bunnies, and you can find yourself thinking, my, what a marvel. But of course, evolutionists, in trying to explain the peacock's tail, end up having to, have to say something like, well, the only reason the male has that kind of tail is because that's the only way that he can impress women enough to have sex with them and have their babies. Uh, it's a much thinner and uh, less, what should we say, a much thinner and much less satisfying story. We don't want to believe that romantic love is mere lust. But if you start with the top, with the bottom up story, that's ultimately where you have to end. Mm, that's good. Yeah, we live on a we live on a hill here in southern Oregon. And you can see out to the to the valley on a sunny day like today. You can we live maybe an hour away from the coast. And so you can you can see way you can see probably 25 miles. You can't see to the coast, but you, there's trees. But you can just see like it's just so beautiful. It's all the trees and everything. And um, you can see out both sides of the window upstairs and 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 just taking that in on a difficult day. It, you know, the, the non-Christian would just see that and be like, oh, that's great. You know, I'm going to I'm going to give thanks to Mother Nature. But yeah, the, right. <laughs> the, Christian, the Christian to the Christian, just to your point, is going to look at that view and give praise to God for making the beauty. And it's all over the place. You know, um, I, I had a little bit of harder time when I lived in the desert in the Mojave <laughs> desert, you know, giving praise to God, but I would do it like when, when in the morning, when the sun came up, it was absolutely just stunning. Just if you've never seen a Southern California sunrise, yeah. sunset, yeah. absolutely just stunning. And these kind of things should give us, give praise, cause us as Christians to give praise to God. 
I I grew up in Washington State and grew up in. Oh, is that right? I grew yeah. up in Edmonds. No way. And I was born in Edmonds. You were? <laughs> yeah. Uh, at Olympic um, Memorial Hospital, probably. Almost no, sure. Steven, Steven, Steven's Steven. Hospital. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 that's right. I was thinking now of Port Angeles, one of my folks. That's right. It's Stevens. Yeah. Um, we had a beach in front of us because we lived right on the water. Uh, and it was more or less a private beach because other people couldn't get to us. And a woods behind us. And I spent from the time we moved there when I was seven uh, until I after I had my accident when I was 17, just a great deal of time in nature. At the time, Puget Sound was such that it was crystal clear for 400 feet down. Just remarkable. And the wood behind us was the place where this rope swing was that I fell off and and perilous myself on. But I find myself again and again. I just said this to my wife the other day. I find myself. So thankful to God that I had those years of soaking in the beauties of nature, because even now, just remembering them, remembering the smell of the ferns in the forest, uh, the chuckle of the creek and, uh, and the goalie below us, those things refresh me and I take them to be gifts from God. Mm, that's so good, brother. So good. Well, how has the full Christian story encouraged you in your suffering? Well, I'm going to give an odd answer here. Okay. And the answer is that it particularly encourages me because of books like Ecclesiastes and Psalms like Psalm 90. Uh, Ecclesiastes, of course, makes it clear that it's better to live wisely rather than foolishly. But then it insists, the preacher insists, that time and chance happen to everyone. Mm -hmm. And he insists, and he says it more than once, sometimes the righteous get what the wicked deserve, and sometimes the wicked get what the righteous deserve. And so Ecclesiastes makes me a realist. When things go wrong, I know that it's not a sign that God is out to get me. It's part of the way that the causal regularities that he's put in the world tend to play themselves out and that he allows them to play themselves out because we wouldn't have an intelligible world if that weren't true. Mm. And then I look at Psalm 90, uh, which, of course, is this lament of the nation of Israel. We're told that Moses penned it. We don't know exactly when. My guess is that it may have been the lament of Israel uh, as they were just coming out of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and um, uh, becoming ready to enter the promised land. And it tells us about the brevity, the pain, and the toil of even the life of God's chosen people. And it starts, in fact, in verse 3 by echoing God's words to Adam in Genesis 3.19. And so what it says is you return man to dust. Interestingly enough, it's not the word for dust that you find in Genesis 3, Dave. It's one that actually involves things being crushed more. And so it's actually saying this was really a hard, that, that we're being crushed by God. You return man to dust and say, most translations have return old children of men, but the word is Adam. And so it's return, O children of Adam. You sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning, it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening, it fades and withers. For, and this is with God's people, for we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Mm. But then the final four verses give us the hope and the prayer that we need to have with God when life is hard. Mm. So teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. Mm. Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, mm. 
And of course, we know because of the consummation, it's going to be a lot more than that, that the troubles of this life, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 4, are going to be as if they're nothing compared to the joys that we'll know in heaven. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we've seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's actually those passages, what what lots of people avoid in scripture because, boy, that's a downer. It's passages like those that remind me that I shouldn't expect this life to go completely smoothly and be completely trouble-free. And as a result, they, they encourage me. They give me hope for what God will bring about at the consummation. Mm. So good. Really good. Really good. Does, uh, does your series have any special features that enable it to be especially useful to believers as they're just starting to think about suffering? Yeah, I, I would mention two of them, Dave. One is that I've worked really hard to write simply and clearly enough that anybody who's willing to think carefully can follow my claims. Uh, and, and I really mean anybody. I think that that well, in fact, I've had one of the professors down at Wheaton where I had, um, she had asked me to come to her class and talk about suffering. And I came and said some of the things that I say about it. Her family after that went through a really hard time. She had young children. She said, Mark, I took what you had said and I stated in words that they could understand and it helped us all immensely. In fact, she wants me to write a children's story version of the first book. So, in fact, I, I try to write really simply, and what that requires is that I write texts that are uncluttered with necessary detail. When the Stars Disappear is only 99, only 99 pages long, uh, and then it's got about 40 more pages of endnotes, and here's the way that that goes. If you get excited reading about the basic story, then I don't want to leave you where you're just hungry I want you to be able to find some of the details that will fill the picture in and make it even more exciting. And that's what the footnotes are. That's what the end notes are there for. They're there for for people maybe just dipping into them and finding that there there's more detail to this story that makes it even more beautiful. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is that I try to make it clear that I'm writing from the perspective of my own suffering. Uh, that I am a paraplegic, uh, even though that's not been the worst suffering that I've ever been through in my life. It's it's a steady kind of suffering. And as a result, I'm not one who jests at scars while never having felt a wound. Paul notes in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians when he says that he and Timothy had suffered so so horribly that they uh, gave up hope in life itself. He says that when God, when the God of all comfort has comforted us in our afflictions, we become able to comfort others in their afflictions, no matter what those afflictions are, with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. And so I hope that's always clear that I'm not, I'm not speaking abstractly. I'm not talking off the top of my head. I'm talking from the depths of what I know in my heart. Yeah, that's really good. And, and I'm thankful that you are writing this because it, it does show through and you're not trying to say everything, but you're saying something and that something is very helpful and people can go find more. And there are so many, so many books, as you know, and I know on this subject that are that are good and that they're helpful. And so I think that's really good. Well, brother, where can people go to find out more about you on social media or on your website or those kind of things? <laughs> I pretty much stay away from social media, but I'd suggest a couple of places. They could go to the website, christianscholarsfund.org, all one word, christianscholarsfund.org, where there's a number of my pieces that can uh, they can pick up and read and some videos of my giving talks at places like at Crossway and so on. Um, they could uh, go to my podcast, whenthestarsdisappear.com. 
all one word again, when the stars disappear.com, we've had six episodes so far, and we've had almost a thousand downloads. So I take it it's been useful to people. Hmm. Another place that could go is to the Wheaton College website and look me up, and they learn some things there. Uh, I've got a page on LinkedIn, and sometimes we'll announce what's going to happen next with regard to the book or with regard to the podcast there. Um, there's a website called Academia Edu, which um, has most of uh, my most of my writings of the last twenty or so years, twenty or thirty years. And of course, the Amazon website has a lot of reviews. Um, it's got I, I don't remember how many, but it, it's it's at least um, thirty or so reviews of my first volume. And it will soon have ones of the second volume. And those things can be can be worth reading to get in the kind of sense of what I'm trying to do there. Hmm. That's really good. Well, as I always say, as we wrap up this show, there's a lot to talk about. And that's doubly true with this, triply true, thousand percent true with this. We'll say it that way. Um, and just as we wrap up, brother, can you give us some takeaways? Yeah. The thing that I found most exciting as I wrote this second volume, Dave, was recognizing the centrality of our Lord's resurrection to how we look at all of life. Um, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the first Christians, that was, that was, that was the source, uh, the basis of their Christianity. No resurrection, no Christianity. And the remarkable thing about that is that for Christ to have appeared as he did, where he had some sort of real body, his uh, disciples could see the hands, and the, the holes in his hands and the hole in his side, um, um, and he could eat and all these sorts of things, yet somehow it was somehow a transformed body. It was a body that could just appear suddenly, as it's put in some of the Gospels, uh, in a locked upper room where the, where the disciples were because they were so scared of the authorities. Here's the remarkable thing about that. I think we can become as convinced as the first eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. We can become as convinced of the fact that the resurrection really took place. And when we do, suddenly the world appears to us entirely differently. It's no longer a place of just causal laws that grind on unfeelingly and uh, that we are just caught up in until we die. Suddenly we have, in fact, a kind of expression of our Lord's promise of consummation in the fact that Christ appears as first fruits of what we will someday be. So that was one of the things. One other thing would be this. We need to recognize that we are living in a great, indeed the greatest story that's ever been told. And we need to remind ourselves of that day in and day out. J.R.R. Tolkien um, wrote a letter to his son, Christopher, during the Second World War. His son was training to be an RAF pilot uh, in South Africa. And evidently, it wasn't very pleasant, as you would know, being a military person. Not everything that goes on in the military needs to go on. There's lots of stuff that can be really aggravating. And Christopher had evidently complained to his dad about this. And so his dad wrote him and he said, Christopher, I can understand all these things that tend to go wrong, but you need to remember that you're living in a great story. And he meant the great story, especially the Second World War. But more than that, Tolkien as a Christian meant the great story that Christians live in. And what he wanted to say was that, in fact, for anything to go right in the world we live in, uh, involves our being willing to struggle and to suffer and to sacrifice. He understood that those things were central, and that's part of the reason he wrote The Lord of the Rings. And so what strikes me is that if we would keep this story in front of us, if we would remember that we're part of this great story and that our little personal stories are meant to move the great story along just a little bit. Who you talk to today, who I talk to today, 
um, matters eternally. If we were to remember that, then in fact, our lives should be transformed in what we do and why we do it. And I think that Tolkien's point is really good. He made the remark that in the midst of a great story, you virtually never know you're in it. Mm. Uh, it's only when you kind of step away that you realize, no, no, this isn't just about my putting one foot in front of the other right now. I'm putting one foot in front of the other because this is the way that God works in his world through us. Yeah, man. Wow. That's really, really good. Really good. Well, guys, we've been talking today with my friend Mark Talbot about his book, Give Me Understanding That I Might Live, Situating Our Suffering Within God's Redemptive Plan. I just want to say you need to go pick up this book and this first one and go do it now. Like, you know, the gift now. Like, if you go look up the gift now. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Like, right now. So uh, you can get the book. <laughs> Yeah, we're going there. Anyways, uh, anyway, you can get it on Amazon, Christian Books, uh, wherever books are sold, uh, Crossway. So, Mark, thank you so much for your time, brother. Thanks for having me, Dave. This has been a great discussion. Yeah, I agree, brother. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.